skyscrapers not done right can be standoffish. So how can skyscrapers be better citizens? Um, yeah, I, I think there's definitely been a tendency uh, towards like perfume bottle design maybe, or um, sculptural, overly sculptural. What do yeah, you mean by but that? I would say like maybe sort of. Uh, I think sculptural is fine, but if it's arbitrary, it's maybe not so interesting. Um, and I think what's. I mean, I think one th one thing that's important is that the the skyscraper as a typology has always been very. Uh, parametric in the sense that driven by specific parameters. Uh, Economic, engineering. Exactly, the, the, the modernist uh, towers were like sort of ultra efficient core layouts, great leasing depths, uh, well detailed curtain walls. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's always about trying to sort of find, incre increasingly refine the parameters by which you design the high rises. Hmm. And I think uh, having lately been thrown into uh, the mix uh, in downtown the with the Trade design Center. of the sure. two World Trade Center. It's no longer a single uh, floor plate repeated. Mm -hmm. it, it's actually almost like a series of buildings within the building, one stacked on top of each other, uh, which in this specific design also opens up the possibility that on several uh, floors, you will have like uh, large sort of common areas that actually expand out to huge hanging gardens. Hmm. So that even if you're sort of, um, working a thousand feet up in the air, you actually have access to a 6,000 square foot garden. Uh, so if you're like taking phone calls or if you're enjoying your lunch or whatever, you can actually do it uh, in the open. Hmm. So I think in that sense, uh, I think maybe the, the range of what is a skyscraper and what happens inside a skyscraper is changing and expanding. And as a result, that's, that's a great occasion for the sky, skyscraper to uh, and the, the, the former variety of the skyscraper, skyscraper to expand with it. Mm -hmm. So that's, you mentioned responding to a series of parameters and that it sounds like you're saying that there's more now, there's more parameters to respond to or they're changing in some way. But how much do you have control as an architect over what those parameters are? Uh, like almost, almost nothing. I think uh, what we have control over, over is whether or not we identify the change hmm. and whether and how well we accommodate it. Uh, so instead of just doing what you were going to do anyway, but then sort of tweaking it to fit the mold, actually realizing that the situation has changed. Exactly. I think there are many professions, uh, and architecture is definitely one of them. Uh, you know, building development uh, definitely also one of them, where you have a phenomenon called skilled incompetence, <laughs> where it's your very experience, the fact that you already know the answer before you even heard the question that stops you from questioning the question or even like having the question rephrased or trying to uh, elaborate on the question or even listening carefully for the question hmm. because you already know the answer. That's really interesting. I wanted to ask you because you always, so everything that you do, it seems like you're trying to look at old solutions in new ways. I mean, as you do more and more work, how do you stop yourself from getting in that trap that you just described of people always kind of falling back into old habits? How do you always, how do you force yourself to look at old problems in new ways? I think it's because we, um, I think in our method is almost a sort of sobriety that we won't do anything just for fun. Sometimes we will do something that is fun, like putting a ski slope on the top of a power plant. Right, and professed uh, hedonist, I believe, right? Yeah, exactly, hedonistic sustainability, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, I think hedonism, if it's a question of like, uh, human enjoyment, I think it's a, it's a good measurement of the quality of the architecture. How enjoyable is it? But, um, but we never do it just for fun. Mm -hmm. We do it uh, because it makes sense. And as a result, our buildings don't look different to be different. They look different because they perform differently. And it's once you uncover either the new necessity or the unexplored potential or opportunity that you suddenly find a real reason to do things uh, differently. And instead of having, come up, having to come up with a nice decor for the same building that you designed last year, what you have to do is find out what is it that's inherently new about this building that forces it to be different, and then how can we uh, accommodate that difference in a way that forces you to 
to to explore new forms mm. or like uh, new materials. Mm. So, for instance, um, the project we are like uh, uh, finishing now here uh, in Manhattan on 57th Street and mm -hmm. the West Side Waterfront, the so-called uh, quartz scraper, the quartz scraper, exactly, uh, came about from like uh, our conversations with uh, uh, with Durst uh, that were interested in trying to explore like a, a mid-rise typology mm. uh, for the site because they actually had a rather large footprint with an uh, with less density than you might normally have in a in a skyscraper situation uh, what we came we came to is that the site was amazing in the sense that because of the uh, the low buildings to the south because it's like the, this moment where manhattan becomes the widest mm -hmm. because of the exposure towards the sunset and the hudson river mm -hmm. it had a lot of light and air but it also had a sanitation garage on one side, a power plant or a steam plant designed by Stanford White on the other side, and the West Side Highway. Mm. So we thought more than anything, these guys need an oasis <laughs> at the heart of the city. And this idea of introducing the courtyard, which is a very classic sort of a, mm. a Danish typology or European typology, but, but rather rare in New York, because if you would make a traditional courtyard building extruded to you know, 40 floors, like no light would ever come into the courtyard and it would right. be a pit rather than an oasis. Mm. But then by making it extremely asymmetrical, uh, we open up the courtyard for the light from the sun and the, and the west, the mm -hmm. sunset, but mm -hmm. also opens up all of the uh, apartments lining the courtyard mm. for views over the Hudson. Mm. So, so each time you, you identify what the unique question and the unique uh, possibility is, um, it opens up the possibilities to discover something that uh, that you haven't done before, and mm. that maybe otherwise wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be possible. Uh, and as a result, you could, you know, the Durst's they're like a third generation, uh, soon to be fourth generation uh, Manhattan uh, real estate developer. Mm -hmm. uh, the fifth generation has already been born, mm. uh, so uh, they definitely know what they're doing, mm -hmm. and they've been developing in New York uh, uh, over a hundred years. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, uh, but working with them with their success criteria, we arrived at something that neither us nor them has ever tried before.